May 11th, 1966, Shade Gap, Pennsylvania. A borough that's home to just under 100 people and a borough that hides a dark history. I was abducted by a gentleman with a mask type thing on his face, which turned out to be goggles with a sawed off shotgun. Five siblings were present with me at the time and he grabbed me by the neck and said that you're coming with me, send them away or I'm gonna shoot all of them. Didn't show any emotion. I showed emotion. Unit two, move into position. Units three and four, maintain coverage of sector seven. I'm not guilty. <laughs> Hopefully clear. We have a visual. Repeat, we have a The following episode is not suitable for those under the age of 13. Viewer discretion and parental guidance is advised. Before we delve into this episode, I'd just like to give a massive thank you to Magellan TV for sponsoring this episode. My regular viewers will know Magellan TV has been a constant supporter of this channel and other true crime channels, and we really wouldn't be able to make the content that we do without their help. So. Don't hesitate to go show them some love and check out their extensive library of interesting documentaries ranging from true crime, history, science, space, and even nature shows. Magellan TV was created by filmmakers and their producers alongside talented curators to ensure that each and every documentary on their service is the most premium you can find. I've been binge watching Mega Disaster, a show that explores some of nature's biggest disasters and their impacts on human civilization. It's really interesting to see how we've dealt with such disasters and the direct and long time effects of them. So after you've gone and watched it, I'd love if you could drop a comment on this video or send me a tweet or Instagram DM with your opinions and thoughts. Use the link at the top of the description or the link in the pinned comments to back yourself a one month free trial to Magellan TV, including all of their 4K documentaries at no extra cost. Now, back to the case. Peggy Ann Bradnick was born on the 16th of August, 1948 in Huntingdon County, Pennsylvania. She was the first child born to her parents, Mildred and Eugene Bradnick. Her mother, Mildred, had been from the Harrisburg area and was born in the late 1920s. Mildred had actually trained as a professional welder during the war efforts, but after the war had ended, there had been no demand for women welders, and so she tried to find work wherever she could. Eugene, Peggy's father, had served in the 12th Infantry during World War II from 1944 up until 1945. During his service, Eugene had actually been shot through the jaw, which saw him spending over a year in hospital recovering. Peggy's father, Eugene, actually had a different birth name to the one he later went by, changing his name to his middle name of Eugene when he joined the war efforts, his first name being a name that he hated. As a result of his service, Eugene was awarded a Purple Heart in the Battle of the Bulge. After Eugene was discharged from the hospital following his gunshot injury, he met and eventually married Mildred Moore, and together they started a new family. Following the birth of the couple's first child, Peggy, the newlyweds went on to have a second child when Peggy was one years old, a son that they named Jim and for a while, the family consisted of just the four of them. When Peggy turned six, the family welcomed a third child, Mary, into the world, and two years later, the twins Debbie and Donnie were born, followed shortly by their sixth and final child, Carol Jean. As you can imagine, raising a family of six was no easy affair, and not one that came at no expense. Subsequently, Mildred turned her hand to any job that she could take. While the kids were at school, Mildred would oftentimes be working a cleaning job, cleaning the houses of those in her area. This cleaning job worked great for Mildred as it allowed her to set her own schedule, giving her the flexibility to spend as much time as she could with her family. On top of the cleaning job, Mildred was known to have been a wonderful cook, baker, and a beautiful singer. 
With money being spread extremely thinly for the family, Mildred turned to creative solutions to keep her kids entertained, inventing games for the children, making do with what they had. Unfortunately, Eugene Bradnick, Peggy's father, had come back from the war with what would later be understood as post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD. As PTSD as a diagnosis term wasn't described within the scientific field until the late 1970s, it was little understood at the time that Eugene needed help the most. The closest diagnostic terminology to be recognised within the scientific community, gross stress reaction, wouldn't be published until the 1952 edition of the DSM, seven years too late for Eugene. Like many other veterans of the time who suffered from PTSD, Eugene turned to self-medication to treat his condition through the use of alcohol, a treatment that would quickly spiral into alcoholism. It is noted by Eugene's family that he had never been the one to discuss what he had experienced during war times, but we can easily imagine the horrors and traumas that he had witnessed. His use of alcohol as a treatment for his condition saw Eugene's reputation in his local community quickly cemented as the local drunk. Eugene would rarely drink alcohol within the family home, where he would mostly remain sober, going on binges when he had been out of the house on socials. Despite his alcoholism, Eugene didn't slack for a moment when it came to being a father and a husband. He never believed himself to have been above partaking in any household chores, as the traditional family dynamics of the time may lead men to believe. And according to his family, he always seemed to have a broom in his hand, trying to make life as easy as possible for his wife and his children. Unfortunately, Eugene had substantial trouble keeping a steady job and a steady flow of income coming in. And for both Eugene and Mildred, ensuring that rent was paid on time was a constant battle. As a result of this, the family of six often moved from rental to rental across the local area, in a vicious cycle of having to move into a cheaper place with less space. But this never stopped both Mildred and Eugene from making do and ensuring that their children received everything they needed in life to be successful. Peggy Ann Bradnick's first grade at school saw her being taught in a small one-room school with just a handful of classmates, and just one teacher to teach every subject to every grade that the small school accommodated. Every grade had a strict schedule of lessons and study time, and disobedience was not tolerated. Honestly, I couldn't imagine how amazing that teacher must have been to be able to educate all of these children by herself and to teach all of these different grades. I think that's really, really inspirational and kind of iconic. Uh, I can imagine being in a school with such little staffing. The year after Peggy began her first grade at school, a brand new Shade Gap Elementary School opened, a school that is still in use to this day. Though due to Peggy's family's rental situation, she transferred through four different schools before her seventh grade. Eventually, though, the family managed to settle in a rental house south of Shade Gap, down a long dirt road. It was a house with no phone and the toilet facilities were outside, but it had running water and electricity. The family counted their blessings, and as they had always done, they made do with what they had. The four Bradnick girls shared the largest room in the back of the house, with the boys across the hall and Eugene and Mildred in the small bedroom next to them. Eugene's mother, Peggy's grandma, lived somewhat nearby and helped out where she could with looking after the kids. And as soon as Peggy was old enough to, and able to, she worked, babysitting or doing housework for a dollar an hour. This allowed Peggy to not only contribute to the household's expenses, but also saw her able to save up money to purchase things for herself. Peggy's upbringing and her siblings' upbringing was strict. A strict upbringing was extremely common at the time. No boyfriends, no girlfriends, no funny business. And both Eugene and Mildred supported one another completely when it came to discipline. It's important to note within the context of this case that Peggy had been hit by puberty earlier than her peers which saw her having to learn about the taboo subjects that came with growing up far earlier than others. She was instructed to never allow anybody to see or touch certain regions of her body until she was with the right man. And if somebody were to try anything, she were to scream, fight, and run. 
something her grandma drilled into her, and a sad lesson that many women and young girls to this day still have to learn. Peggy's father, Eugene, taught her and her siblings about shooting and respecting firearms, of how that they should shelter under the leaves of a mountain laurel if caught out in the rain, and how to orient themselves within the area of Shade Valley in the events they got lost. Just look for the distinctive peak of Sydney's knob at the southern end of the valley. It was said that Peggy and her siblings could be dropped off anywhere within Shade Gap and be able to find their way back home. And as there were no local police force, there had been a lot of self-defense lessons to learn. The area was one that barely saw criminal activity, and it was a community full of people who hunted the local game for food and for profit. Despite the lack of police force and the impression of safety, shortly after the family had settled into their small rental property, a series of criminal complaints began to pop up, not only in Shade Gap, but all over the area. The family didn't have a phone or a newspaper subscription, and so relied on word of mouth usually through the postman, for news. On one occasion, the postman told the Bradnick family about how a man had blocked off a road in the area with logs and shot at a car, injuring another and her child. Though, as this had happened a while away from the family, and as they hadn't anything that somebody might want to steal, they had little concern for their safety. Peggy didn't just have her grandmother living close by, she also had her aunt and uncle living in the area, and she would oftentimes be rewarded with spending time at her aunt and uncle's house. In early summer of 1964, Peggy visited her aunt and uncle's house for an overnight stay on a Friday evening. Peggy had stayed in the guest bedroom of the house, and due to the summer heat, the window in the guest bedroom had been propped open with a vent screen, preventing insects from flying in. While her aunt and uncle were downstairs finishing up their evening, Peggy excused herself and went to bed. As she was dozing off, she heard the vent screen start to rattle. The guest bedroom window overlooked a rear extension to the house, an extension that had a practically flat roof that was fairly easy to gain access to from the ground. Now Peggy dismissed the rattling of the vent screen as simply being perhaps a wild cat, trying to get in to catch rodents, but thought she'd better tell her uncle so that the wildcat doesn't try to get in through any of the other windows. Peggy's uncle told her to wait downstairs as he went to the guest bedroom to shoo away the cat, and after a while, he returned back downstairs with a shocked look on his face. It hadn't been a cat at the window, Peggy's uncle explained. It had been a man. A stranger had rested a ladder against the rear extension to gain access to the roof and had tried to get through the vent screen of the guest bedroom. The stranger's intentions were not something to be dwelled on. It certainly wasn't the local salesman trying to get you to extend your car's warranty, I'll, I'll tell you that. That night, Peggy slept on the sofa downstairs. In March of 1965, tragedies struck a community not 50 miles away from where Peggy lived. Kathy Shea, a little girl, had been kidnapped on her walk to school. The kidnapping was heavily discussed by all those who heard of it, including the children at Peggy's school. Though nobody believed that something as horrifying could take place in Little Old Shade Gap, but it seemed like criminal activity was on the rise in the shadows of the community. On the 16th of April 1965, Good Friday, the day that fishing season began, the community of Shade Gap would be hit by a small yet serious crime. A man called Ned Price, who was actually Peggy's uncle's brother, but apparently they didn't talk and was kind of an outcast from the family, had been outside after dark to dig for worms. Ned's wife had been at church while he went about his worm digging activities, a peculiar way to spend your Friday evening, but I guess everybody's gotta have a hobby. Regardless, as Ned was doing his thing, he accidentally surprised a prowler who ended up shooting at Ned before fleeing. Ned's leg was nearly severed by the shooting, and it ultimately had to be amputated, and the person that shot him hasn't been positively identified to this day. When Peggy was 16 years old, she began her junior year at Southern Huntingdon County High School, where she studied home economics, switching from the business classes in the hope that she'd be able to find a better career for herself. Eventually, Peggy was accepted into the Empire Beauty School in Lewistown, and was set to begin there in May of 1966, studying two days a week and on Saturdays. This would see her have enough time to work a job while studying. 
Peggy was now 17 years old and had a bright future ahead of her. She dreamt of graduating, learning a trade, moving away to pursue a career and starting a family of her own. She wanted to try and provide her own children in the future with more money so that they could live comfortably. And Peggy knew exactly what she needed to do to get to her goals, work hard and be well presented. Her aunt had become involved in Avon and had given her Avon samples, which she had used to practice her makeup skills throughout her teenage years. On Wednesday the 11th of May 1966, Peggy's school held their very first fashion show. It was an event that Peggy had been looking forward to and had spent a lot of time in home economics on the suits that she was going to model in the fashion show. Peggy's teacher had agreed to pick her up that evening from her home to take her to the fashion show and to drop her back off afterwards. When school finished that afternoon, Peggy and her five siblings got off the bus at the end of their lane and began to walk back to the family home. The walk was only about a half mile from where the bus dropped them off to their house. As they walked up the lane with Peggy's brother walking ahead and her sisters walking with her looking for deer, an event occurred that would change the lives of the Bradnick family and their local community forever. A man suddenly emerged from behind a tree and stepped out onto the road. This stranger was dressed in drab clothes, hunting clothes, with an orange baseball cap hiding his face. Green motorcycle goggles covered his eyes, but those details were the least of the Bradnick children's concerns. The man was holding a sawn-off shotgun and aimed it at the children. He moved from child to child, mumbling things like, quote, you're too young, as he examined each sibling. And then he landed on Peggy, smiled and said that she was what he had been looking for. A small struggle ensued, freeing Peggy's siblings from the eyes of the shotgun. Peggy told her siblings to go as the man began to drag her off the lane and into the bushes that lined it. He continued to drag Peggy across a stream and up onto a low ridge. When they got to the top of the ridge, he made Peggy sit down and be silent. By this point, Peggy's siblings had run as fast as they could back to the family home and had, through tears, told their parents about what had happened. Peggy's father, Eugene, had rushed out to try and save Peggy, calling out her name. But Peggy had the muzzle of the shotgun in her mouth and a knife at her neck. She could not reply. The kidnapper told Peggy that she'd never see her father again, that she'd never hear his voice again. The gravity of the situation suddenly set in for Peggy, and the realization that this stranger might murder her family hit her hard. But before Peggy knew it, the kidnapper had taken off again, pulling Peggy along. They ran down the ridge, across the stream, and into another hollow, then up to the other side. Then they did that in reverse, all in what we would later learn to have been an attempt to hide their scents, so that they couldn't be found by bloodhounds. What happened next is unclear, but we do know that the kidnapper forced Peggy to run through the thick overgrowth and woods, through streams, zigzagging and double-backing, seemingly at random. They then came to a road, and without checking for cars, the kidnapper ordered Peggy to cross with seemingly little care for her safety if a car were to come. As Peggy's family didn't have a phone in their house, you can only imagine the panic as they ran to get help. Their 17-year-old daughter had been kidnapped at gunpoint, just a stone's throw from the family home. A massive manhunt for Peggy was launched, which involved over a thousand federal, state, local law officers, national guardsmen, and civilian volunteers. It would be the biggest manhunt conducted in United States history up until that point. Bloodhounds tried to track Peggy's scent, but the way in which her kidnapper had dragged her across the woodlands and through streams completely destroyed any scent trail. The kidnapper forced Peggy to drink the water from the streams, forcing her head into the water. At some point, he pulled a logging chain with a padlock from his backpack and put it around Peggy's neck. He would use this chain to tie Peggy to trees when they rested, although they never rested for long. It quickly became clear to Peggy that her kidnapper was suffering from some form of mental illness or disorder, he would often mumble to himself as if he was speaking to things that weren't there. At one point, the kidnapper mumbled, quote, we're going to the golden egg, and then grabbed Peggy's face and yelled again right in her face, quote, the golden egg, do you understand what I'm telling you, bitch? You know how to drive, right? You better know how to fucking drive. You'll drive or I'll fucking blow your damn head off. Peggy had only ever driven at a slow speed off the actual roads, never on an actual road. 
The kidnapper wanted to get to Mifflin Town, but the direction in which he was taking Peggy was completely the wrong way if he had wanted to get there. As the first day of the kidnapping of Peggy and Bradnick came to a close, and the next day creeped in, Peggy and her kidnapper scaled to the very summit of Sydney's Knob. That summit is the highest place in the Shade Gap Valley, and it gives you a view of the entire valley for miles around. Strangely, when they reached the summit, the kidnapper began celebrating as he watched all the lights drive by on the roads below. Apparently, the kidnapper began mumbling something that sounded as if it were in tongues. The kidnapper watched the search parties below. You could see the lights of the police cars and all of the search efforts. Though the kidnapper's celebrations were not long lived. Before long, he grabbed Peggy and they made their way back down the mountain and started hiking through the woodlands once more. The days blended into one for Peggy, constant hiking through the woods with no obvious goal in sight. By the evening of the third day, Peggy and her kidnapper once again climbed to the summit of Sydney's Knob. Once they were at the top, the kidnapper pulled out a rusty can of peas from his bag, ate a bunch of them and then gave three peas to Peggy telling her that those three peas is all the food that she would get. It quickly became apparent to Peggy that her kidnapper hadn't expected the large-scale search for her to have continued into the third day of her disappearance. He apparently grew very angry that the search was still ongoing, with helicopters and cars and trucks all out searching for any sign of her. It seemed as if the kidnapper took the continuation of the search efforts very personally, as if they were trespassing on his land. The kidnapper's plans began to crumble. Peggy also took note of a small handheld radio that her kidnapper had, a radio he would listen to quietly against his ear, with occasional mumbles of, quote, dumb bastards, before changing the way in which they were going. The pair seemed to circle around Shade Gap continuously, hardly stopping, even getting close to the search effort headquarters at one point. But Peggy knew that if she were so much as to make a sound, the kidnapper would kill her without hesitation. As the days went by, Peggy and her kidnapper barely exchanged a handful of words. Though on one occasion, her kidnapper turned around and spat, quote, you know who I am, say it, at Peggy. Peggy, however, had no idea who her kidnapper was. When she voiced this, the kidnapper replied by saying, quote, never saw me in the store, I saw you there all the time with your daddy. I know who your daddy is. Short, bald, son of a bitch. But that didn't jog Peggy's memory at all. After some tense moments of the kidnapper trying to get Peggy to say his name, he finally came out with his identity. Quote, I'm Bicycle Pete, the one you make fun of in the school bus. And suddenly it clicked. Peggy knew who Bicycle Pete was, and she had oftentimes seen him cycling from the school bus. He was infamous within the local community too, but Peggy also knew that people didn't make fun of him, everyone had their own concerns and worries to deal with, and barely even took notice of him. On the sixth day of the kidnapping, as Peggy and her kidnapper rested, with Peggy chained to a tree, the kidnapper was suddenly awoken by one of the tracker dogs running towards them. The dogs had hooked onto Peggy's scent, and they had found her. The kidnapper grabbed Peggy, pulling her up by the chain, and pulled out his sawn-off shotgun. He then opened fire in the direction that the dogs came from. An FBI agent, Terry Ray Anderson, had been the only person with the dogs. It's unclear where the dog's handlers were, but unfortunately for Terry, the kidnapper's shots hit him, heartbreakingly killing him alone in the middle of the woods. The kidnapper then also fired at the tracker dogs, hitting two of them and sadly killing one. Peggy was then dragged by the kidnapper and fled the area, running away as fast as they could. Of course, by this point, Peggy was severely malnourished and exhausted, with a heavy chain around her neck, but she was forced to keep running. The pair then continued to run through the woodlands and hills surrounding Shade Gap for a further two days. The difference now was that the kidnapper was extremely angry and furious that he had almost been caught. On the seventh day of the kidnapping, the kidnapper and Peggy came across a hunting lodge that had a car parked outside of it. The lodge had an outside wash house close by, which the kidnapper forced Peggy to hide in with him. They stayed in the wash house overnight and into the morning of the eighth day. But as dawn broke on the 19th of May, 1966, the kidnapping took a turn. An off-duty deputy sheriff had been staying in the hunting lodge 
and had risen at dawn to go use the washroom. Now, it's important to note that this deputy sheriff actually had no involvement in the search efforts for Peggy, and had simply come to his cabin on a vacation. When the deputy sheriff emerged from the lodge, the kidnapper shot and wounded him. Thankfully, the deputy sheriff would survive. The kidnapper then, at gunpoint, forced this deputy sheriff into his car and commanded him to drive him and Peggy towards the Pennsylvania Turnpike. The three then drove down the road to a ravine near the Rubeck farm. Officers that had been in the area searching for Peggy saw the situation that was going on within the vehicle. Those officers then opened fire on the vehicle after the deputy sheriff jumped out and screamed that he was in there. Peggy had been forced to lie down on the floor of the car and the officers were completely unaware that she had also been within the vehicle. The injured deputy sheriff ran towards the Rubeck farm and was ushered in by the Rubeck family, who took him upstairs and tried to tend to his wounds. Meanwhile, Peggy's kidnapper dragged her from the car and forced her to run into the barnyard of the Rubeck farm. A full-scale shootout broke out between the kidnapper and the police. The kidnapper stood next to Peggy, who had been in a state of shock, as she heard the shots being fired. It took her a moment, but she suddenly realised that the kidnapper had been hit. Helicopters had already reached the Rubeck farm, and had used their speaker systems to inform those below that Peggy had been on the left and the kidnapper on the right. You see, the kidnapper had forced Peggy to change into clothes similar to his own, so that it would be extremely difficult to distinguish Peggy from him. A boy from the Rubeck family had taken a shot from the window of his farm, aiming at the kidnapper. It was initially believed that it was this boy's shots that had hit the kidnapper, but it would later transpire that it had actually just been a police officer. The shots that had hit the kidnapper was fatal. 17-year-old Peggy was then rescued and rushed to a nearby medical centre, where she was reunited with her family after eight days of hell. A medical examination determined her to have not been seriously injured and to have not been sexually assaulted at any point, though she had severe blistering to her feet and was dehydrated. You see, Peggy had been forced to ditch her shoes during the eight days of hell that she endured at the hands of her kidnapper, made to run across country barefoot. Peggy was discharged from the medical centre on the 1st of June 1966. Her kidnapper was identified to have been William Diller Hollenbaugh, a man who had actually had a criminal record. He'd been convicted of burglary in 1939, which saw him spend 20 years behind bars and also spend time in an insane asylum. William came to Shade Gap in 1962, where he became known as Bicycle Pete on account of him using his bike to travel everywhere. During the eight days of terror that Peggy had endured, William had actually told her about three different incidents that he had been involved in. He claims that in 1964, he had broken into the home of a woman, bound up her wounds and then left. He also claimed responsibility for the attack on the woman and her child after he had blocked off the road with logs and shot at their car. Finally, he claimed to have been the one to have shot Ned Price, Peggy's uncle's brother, causing Ned to lose his leg. These crimes saw William being given the nickname The Mountain Man. Since her kidnapping, Peggy has gone on to advocate for mental health issues. She attended a ceremony where a marker was erected in memory of the murdered FBI agent Terry Ray Anderson in 2011 and has spoken at several different events about her experiences. In 2017, Peggy released a book titled The Voice in the Mountains, a book which we used heavily in the research of this case which describes in considerable detail her experience. I am beyond thankful that Peggy survived this horrific ordeal, though my heart breaks for FBI agent Terry Ray Anderson and his family. Terry lost his life trying to protect Peggy, and Peggy has gone out of her way to honour Terry every day of her life since. Thank you again to Magellan TV for sponsoring this episode. You can find a link to Magellan TV in the description or in the pinned comments below to get your one month free trial. I took a look at the analytics on my channel earlier, and as it turns out, more than 50% of those who watch my videos aren't actually subscribed. It would mean the world to me if you subscribe to this channel. It's completely free, and if you end up not liking my content, then you can always subscribe later. Make sure you hit that notification bell so you can be notified every time I post a brand new True Crime video just like this one. You can find me on social media, Instagram and Twitter, at the handle at It's Joshua Miles. My merch store is actually still live right now, so if you wanted to grab some merch, then jump over to joshuamouse.shop, 
We have hoodies, notebooks, and stickers that I love so much. And with all that being said, I'll see you in the next case. If you or someone you know has been affected by issues covered in our programming, including this episode, then please use the link in the description for information, advice and support.